Some of the very first things we learn about in elementary school, kindergarten probably, are opposites. Big, small, light, dark, hot, cold. Well, we're going to be talking about some opposites today from Scripture as well. Specifically, being generous and being greedy, or betrayal and commitment. Our lesson today is from Mark chapter 14, and if you have your copy of God's Word, I hope that you will turn there with us. This is going to be a lesson about two very different people and how they responded to Jesus as He prepared for His death. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 3, and we'll start with verse 3 going through verse 5. Read with me. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who had a serious skin disease, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of pure and expensive fragrant oil of nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head, but some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted? For this oil might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her. So we start with the setting, as any good story would do. And we learn that this story takes place, this situation takes place in the house of Simon, who Scripture tells us had a serious skin disease. Some translations of Scripture actually say Simon the leper. Now, what we do know about Jewish culture is that if, if Simon had truly been a leper at this moment, they would not have been having dinner at his home. So most likely, Simon is the name of a man who has been healed by Jesus. So keep that in mind as we read through the rest of this story, as we think through the scripture we just read. It says that Jesus was reclining at the table. So to kind of set the scene, this is a situation, a dinner, where men are gathered around the table, a low table where everybody's kind of propped up on their elbow, their feet are sort of away from the area, obviously, where people are eating. And again, it's all men. So in walks this woman, which, first of all, would have probably been a big enough distraction in and of itself that this woman is sort of busting up into their, their man party. But she comes with something, and it's an alabaster jar. So in the South, we might think alabaster jar, like just a, a white mason jar with a little screw on lid. It was definitely not like that. It was elaborate. It was something that definitely would have drawn attention to it immediately. And what it contained, they wouldn't have known just when she walked in, but what she does next, they immediately know what that jar contains. So she, it says she breaks the neck of it. So this woman intends for whatever is in this jar, all of it to be used right here in the presence of Jesus, specifically on Jesus, we find out in Scripture. So she breaks the neck of this jar. She has no intention of sealing it up again. And she begins to pour this oil on Jesus's head. And then everybody knew what was inside, right? So it's, it was pure nard. It's an extremely expensive, fragrant oil from a root found in India. Well, this does not take place in India. So we're not really sure how this woman acquired this very expensive oil or what her motives were. We can't know that, but Jesus did. So immediately, these men in this room start to express indignation. And you'll notice that even Simon the leper doesn't keep them from scolding this woman for what she's doing for Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to respond to these people in just a moment, but those who are expressing this indignation, they're his disciples. As a matter of fact, if this is the same anointing that takes place in John chapter 12, and we have every reason to believe that it is, the loudest of those complaining was Judas. 
to them, what is happening is a complete waste. Why would this woman take this expensive oil and just pour it out all over the head of Jesus? 300 denarii would have been equal to a year's worth of wages for a day laborer in this time. That's a lot of money. And they say, oh, you know, this, this could be given to the poor. Why would she do this? We could have taken all this and given it to the poor. And maybe they were being sincere. But the tone behind what they were saying was, you're just going to let her pour this all over your head? Like, really? And I guess the question is, how often do we see what others are doing? And maybe in our eyes, not doing for the kingdom of God. And, and just as quickly as those disciples made a judgment about what that woman was doing, how often do we do the very same thing? Whether it's time given or attention or money given, we just immediately assess the situation and we make a judgment about it. We have to remember that Jesus is worthy of the very best. See, they had kind of lost sight of who was reclining with them, hadn't they? To them, he was just in that moment, just kind of one of them. But to that woman, he was absolutely everything and he was worthy of her very best. It's not our job to decide what the very best is for somebody else. And that's exactly what Jesus says. Take a look at verses six through nine in chapter 14. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done nothing. She has done a noble thing for me. You, you always have the poor with you and you can do good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. I assure you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. And I would say that that is pretty accurate, being that 2,000 years later, here we sit doing that very thing. So clearly, they did not care if this woman heard their criticism. As a matter of fact, they are directly criticizing her for what she's doing. But she's not the only one who hears it, is she? Jesus is right there, the object of her affection, the object of, of where she is pouring everything out. He hears it too. Isn't that comforting? That when we are giving our very best for Jesus and to others around us, either it's not enough or it's way too much, Jesus hears that criticism too. And even though we may not hear it verbally, he is quick to defend us against the enemy. He is quick to come to our rescue. It stings when people do those things, but we don't hear them alone. So Jesus asked, why are you bothering her? So by the same token, we also have to be careful not to bother those who are truly worshiping Jesus, right? If we put ourselves in the shoes of the woman with the alabaster jar, we also have to be careful to put ourselves in the shoes of those disciples and not make those quick judgments. Jesus takes that so seriously, y'all. We may not understand why someone worships the way they do. It may make no sense to us at all. It may seem like a waste or their gift may seem too extravagant or not significant enough, like the widow with the two small coins. But how it seems to us, that's irrelevant because God is looking at the heart of the worshiper. Let's take a look at this next really short verse. It's Mark chapter 14, verse 10. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to hand him over to them. So we really don't know what Judas's motive is behind this, do we? Is it greed? Is it disappointment? 
in Jesus? Is he trying to force Jesus's hand to make a political move like he knows who Jesus is and he really wants him to step up and take power immediately the way that Judas wants to see it? I don't know, but somehow it flows directly from this story. Like this story of this woman just pouring everything out, this expensive fragrant oil is just what pushes Judas like over the edge. We should always be careful when we, when what we think Jesus should do becomes our focus and what Jesus is actually doing and what God has actually said starts to get blurry. That is a problem. When this happens, we will begin to take action based on what we think is right, not based on what God has said about the matter. And that's what Judas does. In our next scripture, it is chapter 14, verse 11. We're going to see what happens when Judas takes that action. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him silver. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. <laughs> they were glad. Yeah, I would say so, right? I mean, this was a dream come true. Somebody from Jesus's inner circle, they weren't having to really solicit him. He was coming to them. And don't you just know, based on what we have learned about the, the chief priest and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't you just know that in this moment, they just knew that they were right. I mean, if somebody from the inner circle is coming to them, then obviously this is probably a sign that they were right all along. But if your plan to make things right includes betraying Jesus or his word, then your plan may be just that, your plan. Now, was God's plan all along for Jesus to be the hero, to be the sacrifice for our sins. Of course it was. But the truth is, Judas has made himself available to be used by the enemy. And we have to be on guard against that. So let's look, we're gonna skip ahead just a little bit to Mark chapter 14, still in chapter 14, but we're gonna be all the way to verse 32. So if you'll just flip maybe a page over with me, to verse 32 of chapter 14. It says, Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, Sit here while I pray. So Jesus is going to pray, and as it turns out, even though he's speaking to all the disciples, we're about to find out only eight of them stay behind. Three of them, um, those that were in his inner circle, are actually about to come with him. So let's take a look at verse 33 through 36. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and horrified. Hmm. Then he said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. Then he went a little farther, fell to the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Oh man, I wish we had like an hour <laughs> to just unpack this whole section of scripture. It is awesome. But first of all, let's look at, at who he brings out, okay? So Peter, James, and John are coming with him. So they are his, his best friends. And let's think about what they had just done. All three of these men had previously boasted about their commitment to Jesus. Um, Peter had immediately beforehand said, I will never deny you. And James and John, back in chapter 10, we studied about earlier, had when they were requesting the best seats in the house, in the kingdom, they had said, you know, yes, we can suffer with you, Jesus. So these are his best friends that he has pulled out. Now, all three of these men's faith will be greatly tested as we see later in scripture. But I want us to look 
now that we know who he's talking to, I want us to look at the language Mark uses when he describes what Jesus is saying here to these three best friends. He says he is deeply distressed and horrified. He says his soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Y'all, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. That is exactly what Hebrews 4.15 says, and we can see it right here in Scripture. Have you ever been to a point where you just, you felt this way? Like you felt like you were deeply distressed, horrified even, that your soul was just being swallowed alive with sorrow. You start to see how things are falling into place just exactly the way that Jesus is seeing this. And all those emotions start to just come on you. You know, I think that in our culture today, we are tempted to just hold those emotions back here because let's face it, in this culture that we live in, even more so probably than in Jesus's day, weakness is simply not tolerated. I mean, if you are weak, then, then people don't have respect for you, right? And emotion is equated, showing that emotion is often equated with weakness. Well, not in Jesus's economy. Jesus is not a stranger to emotion. He is not stoic. He is not unfeeling. He lets the emotions come. He lets them come. Now, why does he want his friends to stay awake? Well, first of all, he's he may have been talking about physically being awake, but chances are better. He's really talking about being spiritually awake. Like he is saying to them, don't let what is about to happen sneak up on you. Like be aware of what is happening. Take this seriously. But also he is saying, feel this with me. You know, if you've ever had the opportunity to minister to somebody who is really going through a dark place. There is, there is joy there, not always happiness, but there is joy when you can minister to somebody like that, especially when they're your close friend. And there's also joy for that person to know that their sorrow is divided. That's what Jesus is saying. Feel this with me, go through this with me and be alert and take it seriously. Now, the typical Jewish posture for prayer would have been standing straight up, probably with your hands raised, right? So that everybody knows you're praying. But this calls, this situation, according to what Jesus does, calls for face first prayer. Y'all, there are some situations that there's just like nothing else you can do except face first prayer. And that is what we are learning from Jesus in this situation. He called, when you have those moments where you are to the point of being swallowed up in sorrow, that's the time for face first prayer. He calls on God as Abba. So it's, it is a reminder to us that when we are in that situation, when we feel horrified at the things that are happening, when we feel led to, to the point of just being face first before Jesus, that is not a moment when we are disconnected from our relationship with God. Jesus is just as close to him in this moment as he has ever been. So don't buy into the enemy's lie that you are separated from God when you are going through your deepest, darkest valleys. That is not true. And we can see that here according to the gospel of Mark. He's intimate with God and, and there's no record no, of any Jews before this time using this term to address God. He asked God to take this cup from him. Now you remember when James and John, again, were asking for the best seats in the kingdom, Jesus says, can you drink? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Well, here's, here's the cup. This is it. Jesus is about to drain the cup of God's righteous anger for human sin. Can you even imagine? He is being engulfed in a flood 
of suffering. Of course he doesn't want it. Of course he doesn't. But in the end, Jesus affirms his lifelong commitment to God. And he says, not my will, but yours. This is why I came, to do your will. So let it be. Let it be. So our lesson started with Jesus looking at the heart of a woman who poured out everything to honor him. And it ends with Jesus pouring out his heart to God the Father, who would pour his wrath out on Jesus instead of us in order to save us. This is the gospel, and it never loses its luster, ever. All of this so that God can have a relationship with you and with me. It is truly amazing. That woman who chose to honor him, he was preparing to die for her. And Judas, well, he was preparing to die for Judas too. But Judas couldn't accept it. Judas had his own ideas, his own way. Today, we are faced with those same choices, aren't we? We can follow Jesus and we can honor him and very often, increasingly so every day, be considered crazy, out of place, or wasting our talents and our time and our money on a God that we can't see. Or we can follow our own way and we can decide what we deserve and what we think is best, and look for ways to carry that out, just the way Judas did, regardless of what others say or think, including God and God's Word. Can I challenge you today to decide today? Like, before you are in that position. You know, that woman didn't decide when she was in the room that she was going to give everything. She decided back at the house when her eyes fell on that fragrant that jar of fragrant perfume, that's when she decided. And Judas didn't decide when she, he was in front of the priest. He decided before he got there. I want to challenge you to decide today before you're faced with that situation. You know, we also see in Scripture, it says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That kind of resolve, that unwavering resolve to give back what God has given to us. May that be the thing that characterizes our lives. Decide today that the only way you will go is the way that honors God and stays true to His Word regardless of how you look or what others think. Following Jesus in saying, not my will, but yours. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this word from your precious scriptures. I pray that it has served someone today. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. It is not me, Lord. God, I pray that even as I have spoken today, that you have moved me totally out of the way and that your Holy Spirit has done a work in the lives of those who have watched. Lord, we love you. And I pray for courage to show that love the way you have shown it to us boldly. God, although not without turmoil, not without suffering, not without sorrow, but God, to look at those things and to say, you are worth it because you are. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, our last lesson is coming in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to move out of Mark. I believe we're going to be in Timothy, but you'll have to stay tuned next week to make sure about that. Next week's lesson is entitled, Jesus Lives. We're going to take a look at the ultimate impossible situation. So if you have felt like you've been in an impossible situation lately, maybe you can join us next week. That situation turned into ultimate victory for you and for me. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time.